Say a bunch of stuff that speaks to them, and it just happens to be messed up. It's gonna have to be Like, say, to be able to copy, which is get, get that beat, get it. sound trying to say that because it's a little bit tricky should we uh, let's throw the big well, actually no we'll just can do you this. can you see that let's, we'll let's here. there it is there it is all right so we're we're uh it was an ongoing conversation here over the past few weeks in the roastery so how how do you say that bob how do you say that josh get faithy get faith i have to stop and look down and process it I, I it's it's a little natural. bit of a tongue twister, so uh, but we think we got it. Um, I'll I'll tell you one thing. Uh, we one of the stories we we talked about was we used to have this this T-shirt here at Dancing Goats Coffee, formerly known as Bat Dwarf and Bronson Coffee Roasters, <laughs> and and yeah. the T-shirt was no matter how you say it. It's still great coffee. And then it had a list and of it had all a, the different mispronunciations. That's right. Or misspellings. And these were legit um, things that we received yeah. on mailing correspondence. And uh, yes, yeah, so when we were considering the name change to Dancing Goats Coffee, we also considered uh, Backdoor Wrestlers which was yeah. one of the names that <laughs> was on that t-shirt. Or Baldor Fana and somebody. Yeah. Um, back porch, anyway, back porch coffee roasters. If you've been a customer for a long time, or if you've been an employee, or uh, just here in Olympia for a long time, you you may have seen that T-shirt. I might have to uh, try and scare one. You know up. what? I think I have an image from it. Um, Ren, my counterpart counterpart over on the other coast, um, had um, made sure that he had an image posted of uh, of Kurt. Batdorf, mm -hmm. who has that shirt, and I had only heard legend of it, but I actually finally saw all the different names. Long about sleeve, 12 of, about long twelve of them on there. <laughs> there yeah, is. They're all, they're all listed on the back. And it, so the issue I always had in sales is I would go out and people would ask, "Who do you work for?" And I would say, "I work for Batdorf and Bronson Coffee Roasters," and they'd say, "Oh, you work for a law firm?" And I'm like, "Hey, my 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 grandmother yeah. thought I worked for Bergdorf and Goodman for." 10 years. <laughs> there you go. I just finally said, yep, I'm dealing in fashion in New York, yeah, Grandma. Now we all work for <laughs> Dancing Goats Coffee, and we all love Kenya A.A. Gathifi. And you can... Gathifi. See, it's, it's impossible. Listen, you can just call not it impossible. Kenya. You can just call it... It's not a hostile. It's not impossible. <laughs> you can just call it Kenya, though. And I sent a link out there right now. And this is the time when I also want to remind everybody... Two, if you're going to purchase some of this coffee, and I think you should, you can go on our website, follow the link I just sent. I'll also put it in the notes down below. Um, and you'll, wanna, <laughs> you'll also want to make use of it's right there. this guy. <laughs> you want to make use right of there. how would I point to it? Uh, is that better? No. There it is. <laughs> I want, you want to make use of that 10% off on your entire order. Watch and learn. Watch and learn 10. Kids, watch that. and learn. All right. So we digress. Here we are. Hello, uh, Julia. Good to see you. Thanks for popping in. I appreciate that. Um, Julia, can you pronounce Gathefi for us? <laughs> she says she gets to type it. So Phonetically. Type it. Okay, that's Phonetic. right. So, uh, well, we can move on. Yeah. Let's start talking about Let's the coffee. Let's talk about the coffee. So, this is available now on our website. It has been for, uh, we launched this coffee last week. Uh, wonderful Kenyan coffee. Um, something that I, I, I really do wish we had all year. Um, however, as, as is, uh, we, we run out of this coffee and then we look for uh, new ones from time to time. Um, 
main harvest in Kenya, I believe, is the kind of October to December realm. So this coffee landed stateside probably sometime in uh, my little, there we go. There we go. There we are. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no worries. Um, so new arrival, um, really fresh, really just vibrant and, 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 and lovely coffee. Um, lots of stone fruit. Uh, our descriptors for this coffee are nectarine, uh, lemon, uh, more of a lemon zest in my estimation, um, and then uh, white grape. Um, very grapey, however, to me has a little bit more of that uh, kind of white dessert wine quality to it. So, um, Gathethi is the name of the factory. And when we say factory, we mean the, the, the mill that processes the cherry um, and preps that coffee for export. Um, we've had several over the years, Nadaroini. Um, that one was I mean, relatively easy to pronounce. Yeah, I, I mean, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, not as uh, easy as, uh, what was the ma mama? Mama, man, we had one that was actually really fun to say. I can't, it's escaping me right now, but it'll come to me. Just give me a minute <laughs> okay. and, and I'll remember. You gotta, you gotta understand something here, Josh. I'm, I'm kind of getting to the point in my life where things are a little, you know, it's just really right. soaking there's, in There's as so deep much that you've taken to. in over the years that you gotta push some stuff out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, so that's the, the factory name. Uh, it's from the Nyeri region, um, kind of around Mount Kenya. Um, one of the most for growing, some of the best um, coffees that Kenya has to offer for sure. Um, the varieties in this, uh, we're, we're going to say are SL28 and SL34. Um, pretty common variety, Scott Labs numbered. Uh, these are um, kind of been around and been planted in Kenya for quite some time. A um, little bit different look to the coffee. Um, the bean size is an AA as indicated on the bag, which means it's screen size 18 plus. Um, so it's a rather large bean, real kind of round shape to it, which obviously is uh, indicative of the, the varieties um, as far as roast spectrum goes, this coffee is going to be on the lighter end of things, um, but we still like to develop it enough to really bring out some of that sweetness and just not have it be all acid, mm -hmm. right? Or all just bright tangy. Um, is is very uh, has a, has a great high acidity. Um, we want to keep that coffee. When so you, so yeah, when you mentioned the white grape and even the, is it nectarine? Those mm -hmm. are, I mean, those are not as sharp as we might think of like uh, other citrus acids, but still, that's a that's a pretty yeah for sure. Coffee. Um, bold people, yeah, people want a bold cup of coffee. Yeah, this bold. is definitely a bold cup of coffee. Um, f quite flavorsome, as I like to describe it. Flavorsome, I like the word flavor. Of flavorsome. Um, okay. And yeah, so what do you say we get some water on Let's these? Let's do it. And uh, I need to grab a timer when I grab the water, so give me about yeah, no 10 worries. minutes. I'll be back well, in about 10 means, minutes. Well, uh, that means all y'all are with me for just a moment here. Now, I was going to take a look um, at Kenya on the map. that will pull up here. Give me just one second. Here we are. Do, 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 do. There we are. So um, here is Mount Kenya. National, and there's a ring road all the way around there. You know, I, the one place I have yet to go in my life is the biggest place, and that is Africa. Um, and I would love to visit Origin here. I really would. Um, the birthplace of coffee. Yeah. Right? Let me back up a little bit. I mean, just, tr folks, a lot of you probably know this, but to understand just how how massive the continent of Africa is. It, <laughs> it's just, it, it is so large, but here we are. <laughs> We're in the east, Kenya, and right down to the center here we have Mount Kenya. So um, I would love to visit there. Bob, you've been, haven't you? Yes, I have. 
Now, did you go to Kenya or, Eth or Ethiopia? Uh, just Ethiopia, actually. Never been to Kenya. Someday. Yeah. Someday. All right, water's on. We're going to seep these for four minutes, like usual. Um, like to kind of come in after I pour and just get a, a real uh, aromatic assessment of the coffee. Um, first thing that jumped out at me was that kind of nectarine, bright, uh, just real tangy um, smell, almost a little mango like. Um, we get lots of descriptors for this coffee. Um, people seem to perceive or taste different things, which is fine. You know, just because we're tasting nectarine or lemon or white grape doesn't it, mean that's what you're going to taste. popped out to me right away was vanilla, of all things. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Real sweet. Um, real just crowd pleaser of a coffee. Kenyan coffees are just really unique. Um, obviously has a lot to do with soil composition, mm -hmm. uh, the varieties that are being grown, processing, and also unique to Kenya that I can talk a little bit about is, is, is how they export and, and basically sell and coffee gets paid for in Kenya, which is uh, their auction system. They have a government sponsored auction system. Um, it, I believe it happens weekly um, every week, uh, a number of coffees are delivered to a central auction. Um, I think it's capped the number of coffees that are allowed to go through the auction system. It's somewhere around 600 different samples. So quite a few, yeah. you know, it's a lot of coffee. Um, and all these coffees are, are cupped and graded and, and then auctioned off. Um, similar to, to how we would perhaps participate in like a cup of excellence auction. However, it's all done in Nairobi. This is the Nairobi Coffee Exchange. Um, and it really does elevate prices and, and reward quality uh, for these coffees at origin. Um, the, in this case, the Gathethi, um factory would be responsible for delivering that coffee to auction. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's, I, I'd have to look, I, I believe we're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of about 600 different producers, small producers that mm -hmm. deliver cherry to this mill. Um, so so that, that factory or that kind of cooperative society, we like to call it a farmer's cooperative society, or if you look on the coffee report on the website, it's referred to as a FCS, a Copper, a Farmers Cooperative Society. Um, so they're responsible for representing those producers and um, making sure that the payment received at auction is, is then funneled back and to the producers themselves. So um, kind of unique in that way. Obviously, every other coffee or nearly every other origin, I mean, there's no national exchange mm -hmm. um, like that. Does the government um, interact in any other way beyond the auction? Obviously, the auction is going to bring up quality and pricing, but do they have any other controls in place to control the bottom of pricing other than the C market? Um, specifically in Kenya? Yeah, or, in Kenya. Um, you know, I'm really not sure. Um, I, I, I think pricing system has been pretty strong there. So even when the, the, the coffee market globally has been in the toilet, um, people are usually paying pretty good money for Kenyan coffees. Um, I do know that, for example, in Colombia, the, the FNC or the, the, the National Coffee Federation of Colombia does establish a, a minimum price. Um, so it, it, it really does just vary country by country. And, you know, I think the biggest role that government plays in a lot of producing countries is uh, agronomic support. Sure. Um, a lot of them have, uh, you know, agronomy departments that specifically address um, uh, capacity and, and quality for producers. Um, you know, addressing disease, disease and that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so forth. So um, there, there is several aspects of, of the government's role in, in coffee production at origin. Those are just a couple examples. Um, 
Yeah. yeah. So um, we're going to wait a few minutes. Uh, and if you've watched these before, you know that we wait um, for the coffee to cool down. The goal being that if the coffee is too hot, we're not going to be able to effectively or as effectively taste as much as the coffee has to offer. And of course, our experience of um, the flavor, aromas and flavor, changes across time as the coffee cools. Um, so often with African coffees, when I just say African coffee, that can mean so many different types of coffee. Um, but it, with this case, with, this, with Kenya and with this Kenya, um, often I, I want to think that as the coffee cools, it, it, it really has a, a different type of like a lushness to it that I think makes it ideal for cold or ambient brewing. Mm -hmm. Is that something about terroir in Africa or about stock? I mean, these are obviously Scott Lab. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I, it's funny, I mean, you, you mentioned this Kenya, this Kenyan coffee in particular, but one of the coffees for me that I've always appreciated as a cold brew is uh, like washed Yuri Chef coffees from Ethiopia. And I think it has a lot to do with just that flavor profile, those clean, bright fruits. Um, and you mentioned temperature, and one of the things that's really unique about this coffee to me is as it cools, just that, that mouthfeel, that body. Um, and I think that's true to nearly every coffee. As the coffee's cool, you tend to perceive body uh, perhaps a little bit more than acidity. Um, whenever I do my, my cupping classes for new employees, this is something we talk about, temperature and how it affects your, your ability to perceive different flavors in the cup. Um, yeah, this, this coffee, as it cools, is just really silky, really mm -hmm. just viscous, has that kind of syrupy quality to it. Um, yeah, we'll see. We got, we got a little while to, to wait, though, here, Josh. We got we're eight minutes into it. You know what my ideal time? 14. 14. I'm starting to sound like a broken record around here, <laughs> aren't I? Um, um, but yeah, I, I do think this coffee would, would, would do well. Uh, as, as a cold brew coffee, or um, I'll be interested actually to see, it might just get a little little sour, but try pulling some espresso. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll play around with that here over the next couple weeks. Um, Here's something for you to try at home, dear watchers. Uh, brew your coffee, and then let it sit until it gets to the ambient temperature, and enjoy it then. Yeah. Just give it a try. Well, uh, you know, or maybe it's your second cup. You have yeah. your first cup, as you like to have it, and the second one, just let it sit and get all the way until it's just a room temperature and then try it out and see, see what you think. Yeah, absolutely. As I've always said, uh, if you can have a, a room temperature or even cold cup of coffee that tastes good, then you know you've, yeah. you, you, you found a great cup of coffee. And this is something that I always do um, when, I'm, when I'm cupping here in the lab is I leave stuff out until it's tepid, you know, room temperature. Um, and, and it really, you know, bad flavors tend to get worse as, as sure. things cool and good flavors, uh, can fade or they stick around. And this really gives you a good assessment of what the overall quality of that coffee is. So, um, another thing I'll just mention, you know, I talked a little bit about when the, the, the primary harvest cycle or season is in Kenya. Kenya is unique, um, among a few other coffee origins that it has what's called the fly crop, mm -hmm. um, which is that I sort of in between. Yeah, kind of an off season um, harvest. And unlike Colombia, which is the other uh, country that I would point to in terms of an example of a country that has a fly crop. Um, in Colombia, it's kind of like there's just always some coffee somewhere, right? I mean, it's always raining somewhere. So right. there's always some flowering occurring. Um, my, my impression with, with Kenya is that that fly crop actually is a little bit more condensed. It's not, you know, coffee that's just sort of ripening up throughout the course mm -hmm. of the year outside of that primary harvest season. Um, so, um, and, I, and my recollection is that's, uh, let's see, it's October, December. So sometime in like kind of that, 
that May, June, like about now, mm -hmm. um, that there, there's fly crop coffee um, being being harvested in Kenya. Um, and that's anyway, so just interesting little. Something that they're watching for down on the ground, right? Is they know when there's a rain that comes. Yeah, that, you know that for is sure out of, the, out right? of the, the the standard expectation that it is going to lead to more flowers getting um, pollinated, and then it's going to lead to more cherries growing. But they're going to be growing at a different time than that, everything else on the tree. That's right. Them, right. I mean, because it can happen when, when the flowering gets trees. triggered by by rains, then. Eight months later, you're going to have ch red cherries, right? I mean, it's similar to just fruits and how fruits grow here. Um, I think what this kind of speaks to a little bit, uh, not to open up a, a, a real can of worms here, but is, is climate change, right? Mm -hmm. And as these weather patterns change, so does the predictability mm -hmm. of harvests mm -hmm. and 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 capacity, like how this affects capacity issues at mills. Um, and you know, so you really don't want to have to to process coffee all year round because because it costs money to have your mill running. So um, you know, are the rains coming soon, or are they too early? Is there too much rain? Is there more rain than there used to be? Obviously, there's a lot of places in the world that are flooding right now. There's a lot of places in the world that are experiencing yeah. drought right now. Um, you know, the big news in Brazil, the largest coffee producer in the world, yeah. right? Um, is that they're already talking drought, um, another year of La Nina uh, weather conditions. So um, personally, it's, this is the dry season. You know, it's the end of the harvest in Brazil. So, um, you know, we'll see come September. That's tomorrow, right? Yeah. So it'll, it'll, it'll start raining. I, I bet you if you look at a forecast, there's some rain in the forecast for Brazil yeah. next week. I could do that. You want me to pull something up? Um, we're good. Yeah, we're good. Anyway, um, we're getting to time here, so we'll go ahead and start tasting these. Um, let us know what you think, friends. Yeah. And, and also, let us know if you know who the second largest producer of coffee is in the world. <laughs> Not you, Julia. <laughs> Maybe we could talk a little bit about some landlocked producing countries in Africa. Yeah, for one. Oh. Oh, there's, there's should a I few say anything? There. Yeah, <laughs> there's for one is the person that pops This is just a follow-up to our <laughs> South American landlocked country um, yeah. debacle, debacle with, with Daniela. Yeah, with Daniela patiently <laughs> let us be wrong. Yeah. I don't even want to use my spitter. It tastes so good. I think, um, you know, when we talk about these flavor descriptors and I talk about acidity and body and complexity, right? Mm -hmm. It's the complexity of this coffee that makes it what it yeah. is. And and I say that because I swear it's like every time I taste it, I, I, I taste different things. Kumquat. Kumquat. Yeah, yeah. I, I got that. just marmalade and orange um, yeah. well, on, yeah, on this first go sour around. Or, sour orange, I guess, is that's, Would, like, yeah. that's why kumquat was there. For yeah, me. so, uh, and as this coffee cools, like I said, it's, I, I would expect that real kind of silkiness to, to kind of come forth. Well, the body is... Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> the body is definitely there. We'll let it cupping here with um, some of our friends who participate as um, uh, they're essentially tourism leaders. So they come within within you know mm -hmm. the hospitality industry. The Thurston the County visitors. Thurston County, yeah. yeah. And as uh, so we did this cupping, and often we forget this because it's normalized us for us at the cupping table. I said, we got to this point, and I said, okay, now we're going to taste the coffee, and this is the slurping part you maybe you've heard about. And uh, and I went, and I don't even think about it, and I slurped, you know. And everyone's like, <laughs> and they were like, 
they were dumbfounded. <laughs> they, they had their jaws dropped. They were like, oh, we weren't, uh, we weren't expecting that. And I was like, oh, I don't even have the most unique slurp in this organization. <laughs> There are some, there are some distinctive whistler. slurpers here. We whistler. got a whistler. We got a whistler. <laughs> yeah, there's some unique slurps. So, and it's not <laughs> trying to show off. It's just the technique, right, to get it. And they, uh, they were, they were, they were timid. And I get it. It is awkward at first. And if you get too, got to embrace it. You know, you if you get into it, it too quickly, you can also. There's uh, been some, yeah. Drown there's yourself. Been some uh, aspiration we've, to the extreme. We've all done it. So, um, so here's uh, let's see here. We have a question from a couple of folks here. Oh, the promo code from for Bev. Yeah, Bev, no worries. Let me put it up on the screen again here for you. There it is. That's uh, ten percent off, and it's Watch and Learn ten. It says it right down there. I keep there. It is right down there. <laughs> I feel like a, a, an amateur weather person. Um, watch and Learn 10 is the code. You put it in in the promo area when you go to the website. Uh, and then Julia asks, um, with the Chemex, I was able to pull a lot of white grape flavor, and batch strip brewing pulled more nectarine and lemon. My first Kyoto batch mm. pulled some earthiness, but I'm doing another one with different drip rate to try and bring out more fruity flavors. Yeah, as, as always, your, your brew method will affect uh, what you what you taste or what we taste um, different different extractions yield different results of course um, you know I'm not trying to make ma making I like to make making coffee easy for people right um, we have our basic um, ratio that we use of, of grams of coffee to mm -hmm. grams of water um, I think that's a great starting point, regardless of the, the brewing method that you're using. One gram for every gram of coffee. Uh, I, I use 16 grams of, of water. Um, obviously, that requires a scale. That's about as, as, as uh, technical or as complex as, as I'm going to get. Um, if you don't have a scale and, and you feel like your coffee's not tasting perhaps as, as strong, uh, try using more coffee. Yeah. Uh, try grinding a little finer, or use a little less water. Um, pretty pretty obvious things to do 